the worship team exit stage left here thank you gotta have some water drink of this water you shall thirst again all right oh, i need a hey you too that's my tech team right there with the pink headband on all of you <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. They're ready to go. <laughs> All right, it is warm again. Hope you guys are ready. Philippians chapter 3. Go ahead and open your Bibles. <coughs> Hope everyone's all right. <laughs> oh, it was raining here. The other day I was out working and was supposed to rain and it wasn't raining yet and then all of a sudden it just started hailing and then i don't have any hair so the little <laughs> ice balls started to hit my head ah, 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 ah. it's like oh man it's hailing <laughs> so praise god and now it's hot again and this week i think coming up is supposed to be in the 80s so here we go southern california getting ready for summer weather which is not good i prefer um when it's cooler the cooler temps. The other day it was nice. It was sunny. It was clear skies, but it was a cool breeze all day. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I uh, hope everyone's okay. Hope everyone can hear me online. Let me know if there's anything going on. You, YouTube, I know we have microphones, like, so to clear it up a little bit, if it, there's a lot of static or background noise, um, put it in the comments. Let me know. And then probably next time we can we can get it started or before, but I think it's okay right now. There's not too much background noise, and I think this sounds okay because I don't see you guys typing furiously right now. That you guys can't hear anything but static. Oh, praise God! Dodgers are doing good. Praise the Lord! All the money they spent, they better do good. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. Let them spend. It's not my money they're spending. So praise the Lord, right? At least they're doing well. I'm, not, I'm always excited. I'm a Dodgers fan. If you guys don't know already online here, you guys should know here. We have plenty of Dodger hats and gear and different things. Ah, okay. Philippians chapter 3, 1 through 9. I hope everybody's Easter was... Good. I hope you were able to make it to service of some sort in the morning and worship the Lord and get into his word and have a blessed time with your brothers and sisters and later with your family. I know many of us like to eat, myself included. I love to eat. So I hope you guys had a, a beautiful time with 
friends and family celebrating the resurrection of the Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray, and then we'll get into our study. It's been a couple weeks, so it's good to be back. I love you guys. Online, I love you guys. YouTube, I love you guys. Even though I can't see it very well, it's kind of blurry, but somebody's on. Love you guys. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time, for this day, for the ability that you've given us to even come together as a family and a to open your word and get into it. And as we do, Lord, we just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit. Help us as we go through these things to understand your word more and to hide it in our heart, Lord. Help us to live these things out as you speak to us tonight, Lord. Help us take hold of these things. Have a desire when it's done to walk out of here and go home and live these things out and to live in such a way that glorifies you, Lord. So we pray that you would move amongst us tonight, that your spirit would be poured out in great measure, and that through it all, you would be glorified, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Yeah, it's been a couple weeks. Praise God. If you guys are online, and I see some of you online, YouTube, same thing. Um, smash that like button. I always encourage you guys to do that. Um, from everything I know and a little bit I know about social media, when you hit like and different things like that, it, it changes the algorithm a little bit and it'll send it out more. And that's what we want. We want to get the gospel out to as many people as we can. And this YouTube and Facebook just offers us a, a handful of opportunities to be able to do that. So I always encourage you to share the page. Let people know you might be one of those who is really nervous when it comes to speaking even in, in, in a general sense in public or some of us get really shy even to say, hey, how you doing? You know, nice day, whatever. Small talk at the store. So we have a hard time talking about Jesus Christ. This page just offers us a way to be able to do that, to share Jesus with a lost and a dying world. So I always encourage that. If you need a Bible, let me know. We'd love to get you one. We have some here. Uh, just let us know where to send it, who to send it to, and we'll take care of everything else. Don't worry about shipping charges or anything. We'll, we will take care of that. We will get them the word of God. So if you know somebody or you want one yourself, let us know. We'll take care of it. If you're in the area, we say this, stop on by. We'd love to have you. Seats are filling fast. <laughs> so you better get here quick or you might be standing. But if you're in the area, all kidding aside, we'd love to have you come on down. Uh, get in the word with us laugh with us afterwards, maybe have a bite to eat, hang out. It'd be good. We'd love to have you. So come on by. Um, anything else? Easter was amazing. My wife just looked to me. You said that. <laughs> Praise the Lord for wives. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> I guess that means get this show on the road, right? <laughs> Okay, so it's been a couple weeks. Good to see you guys. It's been a couple weeks. So if you haven't now, open your Bible to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. It's not a whole lot. As always, you guys, if you've been with us before, and you kind of know how this goes. We cover, we cover just a handful of verses at a time. I don't see the need to rush. The Lord hasn't put it on my heart to do that. So we're not going to. We're going to take our time and see what the Lord has for us. But we're looking at nine, the first nine verses in Philippians chapter three. We'll go ahead. We'll read it all together. And then we'll get into our study. So picking up in chapter three, the book of Philippians, starting in verse one, reading all the way through verse nine. The Apostle Paul, he writes, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me, to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. 
If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith. Okay. That's a good portion of scripture there. There's a lot here. Very interesting as you read through it. Yeah, we have a lot to look at tonight. So for those note takers, the title of the message is religion or relationship, religion or relationship. And there's some things here and you've probably keyed in on a few of them as we were going through it. Uh, kind of what we're going to be looking at tonight. So it's been a couple of weeks, so I'm going to go back a little bit, cover a little bit of what we've been going through so that kind of brings to memory, refreshes our minds, so to speak. It's Bob Ross time. Let's paint a picture. So we've been looking at it. And Paul, as we've got to this point and all through the letter to the Philippians, he's been exhorting us to live for Christ. In 121, if you flip back, you'll see it. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the motto of Paul. That's his creed. That's what he lives by. And in 127, he said, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then he went on to tell us in chapter two, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we saw the ultimate example as he, he gave us Jesus Christ, the ultimate example of selflessness. Then he said what? He told us to work out our own salvation, which means to work it out to display, to demonstration so others will see it. And it begs the question, how does that look in your life? As you're working out your own salvation to observation, to display, how does that look? And he gives us some things as we went through it. He says, well, this is how it looks. It's someone who doesn't complain and argue. You're blameless, which means you're morally pure. You're harmless. The world can't rebuke you, which means they may accuse you. An accusation may come, but it doesn't stick. And he says that you shine like a bright light in a dark world. Your light shines. Your light shines. And he says, I can rejoice knowing that those things are true in you. I can rejoice. That's the Apostle Paul. I'll rejoice when I know that. And then he gave us examples, a couple more of them. And we looked at Timothy and Epaphroditus. And he gave us these two men to look at. And these two men are a couple of guys, as we read these things, they looked at it and they took it very seriously. And so Paul says, I want you guys to take note of these two. These two here took the things of Jesus Christ to heart. They took it very seriously. And he says, you want to see someone who cares about unity? You want to see someone who cares about the body of Christ? Who's others-centered? You want to see a couple guys like that? Well, let me show you Timothy and Epaphroditus. These two guys are working out their salvation demonstration. You guys can see it. And so he gives us these two and he says, take a look. And so as we looked at them, we saw the effect that Jesus Christ had on these two men's lives. And now we jump into chapter three and he says, 
Finally, in verse one, my brethren, he says, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And then he gives us a warning, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. So he says, finally. Now, when we see that, that word finally, I'll touch on it quickly. Uh, it's not the idea that the, the letter's ending. Like, oh, finally, you know, I have this last thing. No, the letter's not ending yet. The idea is now moving on. And so he continues a thought here. And he says what? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. The theme of the, the book of Philippians to this letter, joy. And he says what? Rejoice. He says, finally, my family, my brothers, my sisters, my loved ones, rejoice in the Lord. It's interesting, and I'm a words guy, so you guys have been here enough online. If you guys have been with us before, you guys know I like to pull out different Greek words. I'll take a look at them and see what's going on with those words, definitions, and different things, and the tenses. This word rejoice here, it's actually a present active imperative, which means, if you guys are familiar, it's a command. This isn't a suggestion. It's something we must continually be doing, rejoicing in the Lord. You only be rejoicing in the Lord. Even when life is hard, you can rejoice in the Lord. And sometimes, and we know it, because we live it. Life is hard. Life is hard. It's like they, you can make a bumper sticker. Right? I don't know if people <laughs> still do that anymore. Bumper stickers. Um, I don't know, even know if they still sell them because I don't go looking in places. But I'm sure at like truck stops and different things, they probably have some on like a, a kiosk or something you can spin in. There's all kinds. But they should make a bump, bumper sticker that says, life stinks, Jesus is coming. Right? Because life is hard. And it does stink sometimes. It does. We go through things sometimes that are heartbreaking, that shatter your world, that rock you to the core. But he didn't say rejoice in your circumstances. He said rejoice in what? The Lord. The Lord is above your circumstances. So no matter what you go through, whether it be a, a hard death in the family, and we all go through those things, every single one of us will lose people we love. That's just life. Or it could be the loss of a job unexpectedly. You're going into work, everything's okay, and then unexpectedly the boss comes in, calls everyone and says, hey, look, I'm sorry, I got to lay off 40 of you. That's your circumstance. But God is above those. And you can always rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because those things are hard, yes. But if you're born again, you have salvation. We know this is not the end. This is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. Whatever comes by, it's not the end. And I have the Lord. And it's in him I rejoice, not me. I don't rejoice in myself. I don't rejoice in all my circumstances. I rejoice in the Lord. Remember Paul and Silas? They got beat down. They got beat down. <laughs> I don't know why I thought, thought of Shrek right now. Police brutality. Right, <laughs> they got beat down, right? They got thrown in prison, and they're sitting there shackled, like spread eagle, like this in the dark. It's not a nice situation. They're they're all bloody, they're beat up, their backs are open. And we know the story, right? They begin to sing and they begin to praise the Lord. They praise the Lord. And I'm sure at that moment, they're sitting there. They're not happy. Like, oh, man, this is so great. My back's just bleeding. and oh, I got all these wounds. and 
who knows it could get infected and this is painful i'm spread out you go like this like to the max where it hurts they didn't make it where you were comfortable i'm sure they're not sitting there like oh this is so awesome lord they're not doing that but then they begin to praise and sing worship and the whole prison hears it we know the story they're rejoicing in the lord not in their circumstances they're rejoicing in the lord And we just celebrated, and I talked about it just a second ago when I was saying, oh, how was your Easter and all that? And we just celebrated it. And we sang all kinds of beautiful songs. They had the choir up there. If you guys went to church in the morning, they had the choir, and they had the kids' choir, and they were all singing. And <laughs> It's always great when the kids sing, right? <laughs> no matter how it sounds, it could sound so beautiful or it could sound so horrible. But because they're children, we all smile and it brings joy to our hearts. And we're like, oh, man, that's awesome. And on Easter, we got together and we celebrated what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus paid the price for our sins. And on the third day, he rose. And we celebrated that. He said what? On the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Salvation is a free gift, and that never changes. That will never change. And knowing that simple fact is a cause for us to rejoice just in that alone. And every day, no matter what's going on, at every hour, every minute, I can rejoice in the Lord. And that goes for all of us. Our circumstances will change, but our God does not. God never changes. So no matter what happens, I'm a child of God. I'm not of this world. Jesus loves me. I've been born again. And he's coming back. Even as I say that now, a smile comes to my face. My King, my Savior, my Lord is coming back. In that, I can rejoice. Not in what's going on around me. Not all the hard stuff. Not all the bad stuff. I rejoice in Jesus Christ. And Paul says to rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice in the Lord. Then he goes on to say, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious. I think the King James says grievous. But for you, it is safe. So he's saying to remind you of these things, to encourage you of these things, it's not tedious. And he says it's safe for you. That's an interesting thing, right? It's safe for you. Why is this safe? It's not tedious. It's not hard. I'm glad to encourage you. I'm glad to exhort you to these things, to remind you of these things. Why is it safe? Because as we rejoice in the Lord, what are we not doing? Rejoicing in ourselves. This is important because of the temptation of wanting to rejoice in the things that I can do. To rejoice in ourselves, to forget the Lord and get caught up in what I'm doing and not in what he has done. There's always temptation there because we want to be able to say, look what I did, right? I'm great, right? The goat. You hear that, that phrase tossed around a lot right now. Oh, he's the goat. Oh, that's the goat. And then you'll see different arguments happen, right, over certain people. No, 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 that one's not the GOAT. This one is. And then, you know, especially when it comes to sports. The greatest of all time. And we love to do that. We have Hall of Fames because we love to put ourselves on pedestals and say, look it. I'm the best of the best. And we like to do that. And there's a temptation there because we like to do that. And for you, it is safe to remind you of these things. Rejoice in the Lord. You don't rejoice in yourself. You rejoice in Jesus Christ. 
and Paul is, we're going to see this as we move forward. He's going to warn them about empty religion because we have the Judaizers and we're going to talk about this. They're there. It seems like they're always there. It's like whack-a-mole, like the Pharisees. They were always there when Jesus was teaching and he was going around the different cities. The Pharisees were always there. It was like whack-a-mole. Well, the Judaizers are, are similar in that sense. It seems like they're always there listening to Paul and following him. And so he gives us these warnings that we're going to look at. And the first one in verse 2, he says what? Beware of dogs. Oh, we see those signs, right? <laughs> I do delivery, so I see them on fences. Beware of dog. A lot of times some little dog comes up. You're like, oh, really? And then you go like that. Ah, and then they run away. And then they turn like 10 feet, 10 feet down the road. And then they turn around and start barking some more again. <laughs> But be, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. Now, you'll remember that the Jews would call the Gentiles dogs. And for him to call the Judaizers, as we're talking about this, dogs would be shocking to them. Because that was a term they used towards the Gentile believers or the Gentiles in general. They were dogs. And then he says, beware of what? Evil workers. And then he says, beware of the mutilation. So he says, beware three times. Quickly, this is also a present imperative. That's a command. That tells us, Paul is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul, God himself is saying, you need to constantly beware of this. Be looking out for this. This is a big thing. This isn't some small little deal. Beware, beware, beware. It's a warning. So as we see it three times, this should tell us to key in and say, oh, this is important. Right? <laughs> we see it. Beware. 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 This tells us it's serious. It's serious. And so we're looking at and Paul's looking at and dealing with the Jewish legalists, the Judaizers. They hated the church, kind of like Paul before he was converted. He hated the church. And they would follow him around, these Judaizers, and they would see believers and they'd say, yeah, you know what, you guys, you have Jesus. But you know what? You also need to be circumcised. Yeah, you have Jesus, but you know what? You also have to keep the Sabbath. You have Jesus, but you got to follow the dietary laws. Come on, you guys. You, gotta, you know, you have Jesus. Yeah, okay. But you also have to do this. That's who Paul is speaking about here. These Judaizers who are coming and saying, you have to do this as well. You have to do that as well. You have to do all of this too. And you got to eat like this. You got to look like this. You got to dress like this. You got to sing and dance like this. That's who Paul is addressing here. And Paul is saying to the Philippian church, as well as to all of us, in regard to these Judaizers, because Judaizers still exist today, we're going to get into this, that they must always beware of those dogs. Notice he says to evil workers. He says evil workers. So dogs speak of their character. They're ravenous. They're going to tear you up. They're, they're like the wild dogs that roam San Bernardino. Right? You see them. Man, sometimes you almost crash into them. Like if you don't see them, they're coming out like packs of German shepherds, just like three with like a couple huskies. And then you have like a little chihuahua going with them too. You're like, where'd you come from? You know? And they're crossing the street and you're like, oh. It's like that, and they're, and they're barking, and they're, they're causing chaos. They see other dogs. They run up to the fence. Now dirt's flying, and everyone's like, rah, 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 rah. right? That's the picture here. The dog spoke of their character. Evil workers speaks of their behavior. But notice he says it's evil. To me, that's interesting. 
I look at that, I'm like, oh, evil workers. Well, why is that? Why is what they're doing evil? Because in one sense, you could look at it and say, well, aren't they just trying to, to get you to go to God and, and to do more of what God has said? And you can look at it that way, like, oh, they're just super holy. And they just want you to do all this, right? So you look at it, and he says, he calls it evil work. He calls it evil work. So why is that? Anything, this is important, anything that takes away from Jesus Christ is evil. Anything. And this is what it's doing. We talked about it. Especially over Easter, Jesus hung on the cross. He said, it is finished. It's paid in full. The Greek word to telestai. It is finished. And to come along and say, you have to do this and that. Tells everyone that Jesus is a liar. It's not finished. And you have to do something else on top of what he's done. That makes that evil. Anything that takes away from Jesus Christ is evil. And that work is evil because they are trying to accomplish something. That's work, right? You're trying to get something accomplished. And that work is evil. So what they are trying to accomplish flies of all that God did by sending his son into the world. And by doing that, you're saying, God, that wasn't enough. Jesus Christ, you said it's finished, but it's not. That's what you're saying. And Paul is telling them that is evil. That's evil. That's evil. Anything that takes away from Jesus Christ, that lessens him in any way, that robs him of his glory in any way, is evil. And he says, what? Beware. You must constantly be looking out for that. And we have that to this day still. Then he says, beware of the mutilation. Now, Paul here, when he says, beware of the mutilation, he pulled a word that was used in the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So you'll see it in the Old Testament, this word. Leviticus 21.5 is, is an example. It says, they shall not make any bald place on their heads. Man, I'm in violation already. <laughs> nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any, here it is, cuttings or mutilations in their flesh. The Jews were forbidden to mutilate their flesh in any kind of pagan worship. 1 Kings 18.28 says, so they cried aloud, you guys are probably familiar with this story, and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. This is when all the prophets came down and they were going to see which one showed up and consumed the fire. If you guys aren't familiar with the story, I, don't, I won't go into it too long, but you can read it. First Kings chapter 18, read it. It's a great story. I love it. Uh, read it. You'll see it's awesome. So this in first Kings, it's a pagan type of mutilation of the flesh. They're sitting there. And they're dancing and they're cutting their flesh and they're bleeding everywhere. They're trying to get their God to come down and consume the sacrifice that's on the altar there. And Paul is saying to us that the Judaizers, they've lost the ideal of what circumcision truly represents. And that all they are is just mutilators. They're imposters. For them, Paul would say, for them to think that you Gentiles need to circumcise yourselves to add anything to what Christ has already done is just a mutilation. That's all it is. It's a mutilation. This is an offense to the cross and all that Jesus has done. And Paul says, you need to constantly be looking out for these dogs, these evil workers, always be looking out for these dogs. All right, a women, this is, doesn't mean some dirty guy. All right, some boneheaded dude on the street. Don't, that's not the dog he's talking about, okay? He says, always look out for these dogs. 
the ones who what they want you to try to measure up to God in your own strength. And Paul says, that's not circumcision. What that is, is just mutilation. In essence, Paul is saying that's pagan. Oh, that's an interesting thing. And he says, for we are the circumcision. In verse 3, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, <laughs> though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. So this gets interesting. He says, we are the circumcision. This would be shocking, right? Because the Judaizers, they thought they were the ones who were truly circumcised and right before God. And Paul says, no, we are the true circumcision. So that would shock them. And so as we continue, we look at it, and we're going to see the next things that he talks about. They tell us what circumcision really is. They tell us what it's really all about. And the first thing he says, he says, for we are the circumcision. If you look at your Bible, it says, who worship what? God in the spirit. God in the spirit. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. This defines true circumcision. The legalists thought they were worshiping God by doing these fleshly things, right? And Paul is saying that's all wrong. What God was interested in is that my heart was circumcised. That I had the heart after the spirit and not after the flesh. What good is all, as we're going to look at this, what good is all the religious stuff if there's no relationship? What good is all that stuff? It's like baptism, right? A lot of times, especially if you grew up in a Catholic household, and even in some other churches, baptism is held in, in high regard. And so you get baptized as a child or as a baby, usually within, you know, a few months of your birth. And they take you down and they don't immerse you. They'll sprinkle a little water and the baby will go, ah! right? Because they don't like the stuff in their face. They're all shocked. Like, and it's probably super cold to them. They're all warm, bundled up. And then they go, ah! like that. Like, it's so cruel sometimes. Like, you're like, ah! In the name of Jesus, ah! And the, the water hits them, pss, and they're all, ah! Right? They pause for a second, and they're all, ah! And then everyone, as they're screaming, crying, everyone's like, oh, it's so beautiful. That's so amazing. The baby's hating it. He's like, I hate this. If I could kill you, I would. Right? That's the baby's thought at that moment. <laughs> While we're saying, oh, it's so great, right? Well, baptism is, is like that. What good is baptism if there's no inward change because baptism baptism is only an outward demonstration of an inward reality and what good is getting baptized if you don't know christ if there's been no change if you haven't been born again all you have is religion all you have is a work that you've done and because you've done it a lot of times people think, oh, I'm okay. And that's the Judaizers. You need to do this to be right with God. And Paul is saying, no, that's not what it is. It's not that. It's not all this religious stuff I can do. It's not me coming here Sunday evening, Calvary New Beginnings. Oh, I went and I was, I was religious about going and I have... Look at, look at my name right here. Look, look, look. I got six yellow stars in a row. And we think we're good because we do that. Or we go to church Sunday morning or I take out the trash on Wednesday nights at church or we're at whatever. Or we can get caught up in all these works related things that we think, oh, that's okay because I'm doing that. 
But what good is all that stuff if there is no relationship? It's pointless. It's useless. We're going to see how useless this really is and how strong Paul thinks about this. He's going to use some strong language as we move on. And he says, rejoice. What? In Christ Jesus. Our joy is not found in ourselves and what we can do. It is found in Jesus and what he has done. Never forget that. And he says, and have no what? Confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh, right? You have no confidence in your ability to be righteous before God. Your confidence is in Jesus Christ. Paul really understood this. In, in Romans, he, he wrote to them in his letter to the Romans in chapter 7, verse 18. He says, for I know that in me, this is the apostle Paul, he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Nothing good in my flesh. There's nothing good there. Paul is saying, I don't have confidence in my flesh. He's saying, I know who I trust. And it's not me. I trust in him. And who's him? Jesus Christ. That's who you trust. It's not me. It's him. So I guess the question, here's one to pose to all of us. Who are you trusting in? When the lights go out here. You stand before the Lord. Who are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Yourself and all the things that you can do or have you think you've done? Is that really what you're going to bring to God? Or are you going to tell him, I put my faith, I put my trust in your son? <laughs> That's all I have, God. You said, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, you said, I will be saved. That's what I got. That's what I got. Or are you going to get to heaven and you're going to say, look, God, I did this, this, and that. And I did this. And I was good. I was a good little boy. I was a good little girl. I went to church all the time. I even lifted my hands a couple of times. It felt weird in worship, but I did it anyways, God. I put my hands up for you. Now what you're going to say? What are you going to say? Who are you trusting in? Then Paul says, I'm more so. Sometimes when I read this, when you read it, really, I don't know why I'm thinking of this right now. As I read it, I see, I'm more so. Like, I kind of want to talk like that in public. And someone asks me something, I'm like, I'm more so. Right? And people are going to look at you like, what's with this guy? <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> what do you mean, I'm more so? <laughs> You read it, it sounds like so, I don't know, to me anyways. You're like, oh, that's cool. I want to talk like that. Anyways, I'm more so. You think you could trust what you've done and all those things? You have confidence in your flesh? This is what Paul is saying. He says, I'm more so. You think you could trust in what you've done? Oh, you think you can have confidence in your flesh? Well, guess what? Take a look at me. Now, Paul's going to have us look at himself, and he's going to use himself here as an example of someone who could. If there was confidence in the flesh, Paul will say, yeah, that guy was me. It was me. And so he's going to give us an example, and it's a personal one. He says, if there's anybody who could trust in their good works, that dude, that guy, stand right here, that's me. The Apostle Paul. Because as we look at this, there's going to be people, because he's told us, you need to look out for this, beware, because there's going to be people that are going to tell you, you need to do this, you need to do that. All these type of things. You can't go there. You need to go here. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? You need to do this. Well, you've done this. You were born into this, this, and this. You've been this your whole life. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sound familiar? You know, 
some of us may be able to really relate with this. Oh, you can have family, right? We can sit here, we can all have family and say, you go where? You're doing, huh? When are you born again? What's born again? You were born a Catholic, right? Uh, we can hear that stuff. And I I'll tell you right now, <laughs> nobody's born a Catholic. I mean, I was born, and you could even go out, you know, somewhere else. I was born a Baptist. <laughs> You were born, you know, you weren't born a Baptist, you were born a sinner. You were born a sinner. Not even John the Baptist was born a Baptist. But you'll hear that, right? You're a Catholic. What are you doing? I can't believe it. Like it's like, oh, I don't, it's, it's beyond me. And they'll be like, where do you go to church? And they'll look around, they'll go with you. Where's the stained glass? There's no stained glass here. Where's Jesus on the cross? How come there's no thing, nothing here of Jesus on the cross? You'll, you'll hear that. You'll hear that. Oh, that's a cult. You're going to a cult. And that guy up there preaching, he's the cult leader. You need to get away. Right? You'll hear that stuff. It's so crazy. It's still around today. And they can't stand what it is that you don't do all that religious stuff. And some of them, if they're really invested in it, their lives are invested in it. That's why they say you were born this way, right? You were born this way. And they're so invested in it. And they look at it like, now nah, you're not doing all this religious stuff anymore. And they're upset. And they're upset. And their lives are so invested in it. And Paul says, you want to talk about religion? About stuff you needed to do? You guys are all rookies. Right? I made it to the big leagues. I'm the professional ball player. You guys didn't even make it out of rookie ball. It's a week. Let me show you somebody, right? And I picture like the Sandlot. I don't know. I was picturing this as I was reading it the other day. I was putting my study together. I was picturing The Sandlot. I don't know. I love that movie, The Sandlot. It's such, it's such a great film, right? It came out when I was, I don't know, 14 or so. So it was just like yesterday, right? <laughs> 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 Anyways, I was thinking about it because I like picture when they come up and they're all playing ball in the part in The Sandlot and then the, the opposing team, the rival team comes and they come riding their bikes, dun, 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 right? And they think they're going to challenge them to a game. And they're like, and the one guy says, he tells Benny, he's the only one who should be playing. He says, the rest of them besides you, Benny Rodriguez, are a disgrace to the game. And that's when you see, you know, hands. What'd you say? You heard me, right? You know, it goes through a bunch of things. And that's kind of Paul. He's kind of looking at them like, you guys are all a disgrace. It's me. You want to look at somebody who kept all that stuff, who did all the religious stuff? It's this guy. It's this guy. And he says, he gives us a list here, and he's going to give us seven points. That he's, he's going to give to us what you could call bragging points, right? He's going to give them here. So he says in verse five, he says, we'll look at the first one. He says, what? Circumcised the eighth day. That's the first bragging point he brings out. He's saying what? Guess what, guys? I'm an eight dayer. That's me. I'm an eight dayer. The Ishmaelites, they were circumcised at 13. Converts into Judaism when they came around, the men, then they were circumcised, but that's as adults. And Paul is saying, not me. <coughs> I was according to scripture, just like the Bible said. I'm an eight-dayer. You'll see that in Leviticus 12, 3, if you want to look it up. Secondly, he says, I'm the stock of Israel. I'm the stock of Israel. This isn't like, you know, Wall Street or anything. Israel, I'll you know, give me two on Israel type thing, right? 
That's not that. I am out of Israel as an origin. I'm not a conversion. I'm not a convert. I am an Israelite. My origin is amongst God's people. The third thing he says is what? Of the tribe of Benjamin, right? Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. That's huge bragging rights. That's huge right there. Because it was only the tribe of Benjamin that stayed with Judah while the other 10 left. Benjamin stayed loyal to David. And his parents probably, as we look at this, named him because his name was changed to Paul. Remember, it was Saul. So his parents, because he's from the tribe of Benjamin, named him after the first king of Israel, Saul, who was also a Benjamite. He says, I'm from the tribe that stayed loyal. All you guys are just deserters. You guys did your own thing. That's Paul. Then he says what? Hebrew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. The Greek sense of it is I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now there's a couple truths here to this. Scholars will tell you as you read commentaries and different things that he wasn't Hellenistic. One truth is that his parents probably brought him up not knowing Greek, knowing Hebrew and Aramaic. They could be saying, and that's one truth, he's probably saying I'm not Hellenistic. I'm a pure bred Jew. I have no outer influence. Another truth, and probably the greater truth, is both my parents are pure blood Jews. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Both my parents are Jews. So that's important. When you, if you go, if you want to go to Israel and, and go there on Aliyah, you're a Jew and you're wanting to go to the homeland and relocate. You want to go over there. It's not, it's one thing to say that your dad's a Jew, but your mom has to be a Jew. Why is that? Because your mom can just say your dad was a Jew. And you wouldn't really know unless you did DNA and all those different things, right? But if you popped out, the one that you popped out of is a Jew. Your mom popped you out. Now you're a Jew. There's no way around it. And Paul is saying, both my mom and my dad are Jewish. I'm a Jew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And so that's his pedigree. So he's like, this is my pedigree. You want to look at it? This is my pedigree. Now, they, these last things, these last three we look at are choices that he made. The fifth one we see is that it says he's a Pharisee concerning the law, a Pharisee. Matthew 5.20, Jesus said this, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That was Paul, right? He was a Pharisee. Pharisee means what? Separated ones. They're the separated ones. They were the religious elite. A lot of scholars say that the number may have reached around 6,000, but never anymore. So they were a small group, the religious elite. Everyone looked at them like, oh, that's a Pharisee. Oh, that's a Pharisee. Oh. That's the Apostle Paul, he's saying, I was one of those guys. Those guys that you would look at and be like, oh, that's a holy man of God. Right? They were the ones who preserved the things of God. They were, in essence, I'm orthodox. I keep all the things of the law. I use the whole Bible. I'm not like the Sadducees who only use the first five books. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in angels and 
and resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. I love that joke. <laughs> Even if I'm the only one who laughs. <laughs> well, Paul's saying, I was a Pharisee. I was orthodox. I kept the things of God. I was part of the religious elite. And then he says a sixth thing. Says, Concerning zeal, what? He persecuted the church. And he's saying, look at me. There was no one more zealous. There was no one more zealous. I was persecuting the church. When you read Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit says, Paul made havoc of the church. Paul himself says, I want to ravage it to the ground. And he's saying, you guys are amateurs. I'm a pro. I was zealous. You guys think you were zealous? You had zeal? Look at me. I was more zealous than anybody for the things of God. I was persecuting the church. and I was trying to burn it to the ground. I was a member of the Sanhedrin, the voting council. And he cast his vote against Stephen. As they stoned him to death, he cast his vote to stone him. And he was there, and he's like, I'll hold your coats, guys. You go kill him. And he was there as Stephen was preaching, and he looked up into heaven. He's like, I see Jesus. He's at, he's at the right hand of God. Paul was there. He cast his vote against him. He said, you guys want to see zeal for the things of God? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. And the last thing he says, he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he says what? Blameless. What's he saying? No one could point a finger at me. By human observation, no one could blame me of anything. You want to play religious games? You want to brag about religiosity? You don't know anybody with my and the zeal that I had. You don't know anybody. You don't know a more religious person than me. There is nobody. That's why he says, I more so. You don't know anybody more religious than I was. And he's going to tell us right now because what does that all amount to? He's going to tell us what all that really amounts to. All that religious zeal, all that religious stuff that I had, all that religion. He's going to tell us what he has to say about this and how much it really amounts to. So he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted what? Loss for Christ. He says, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered for the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So gain and counted loss. Paul uses some interesting terms here. He's using accounting terms. So he says, but what things were gained? Look at that in verse seven. In essence, which were what? Assets to me. And he's saying, everything I thought was a credit was actually a debit. Was actually a debit. Everything that I thought added up for me to be something, to be somebody, actually ended up to be nothing. It ended up being nothing. And Paul is telling them and telling all of us, don't listen to these guys. The guys who brag. Why? Because I have bragging rights. I had that. They think they have bragging rights. I know more about religion by, by pedigree and by choice than any of these guys. I did every religious thing you could do, and I outdid them on every single point. And I'll tell you what I did with it. I counted it as nothing. It was worthless. That's what Paul was saying. Think about it. 
Paul would say, when I encountered Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and what he, when I realized what he did for me on the cross, all my religious stuff went out the window. It blew away with the wind. It was worthless. There's a very important point here. As we look at this, he's got some important things to say. He says, everything I counted as a credit, those things I have counted lost for Christ. Have counted. The idea there is it's done. I've taken all of it and realized that it doesn't amount to anything. And notice in verse 8, this is very important as we look at this. He says, I count it all lost for the excellency of the knowledge of who? Jesus Christ. In other words, for the excellency of the experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ is what's being said here. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying as we go through this. I had all the religion. I had all the religious practice. All the religiosity, I had all those things that make you feel like you're doing something for God. I'm doing something. And I'll tell you what, it amounted to nothing. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's telling us, listen, I had all of that. I did all those things you guys think matter, and I'll tell you right now, it doesn't matter. It amounted to nothing. And when I encountered the risen Savior, I realized that it wasn't about religion. It was about relationship. I count it all loss for the experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. That was all religion. Paul is saying, I now have relationship. I have a relationship. And that's what it's all about, right? That's what it's all about as we look at this. It's a living relationship with a risen Savior. I can rejoice in the Lord, not because of what I've done, but because of what he has done. And that will never change. That joy is steadfast. It's set. It's right there planted in my heart because I know it doesn't rely on me. It's on him. He's the one that never fails. And so my trust is in him. I can rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. His whole drive, the Apostle Paul, is that I might know him. That's the drive of the Apostle Paul. He has tasted, like the verse just said, he has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And what has it done? It has caused him to hunger for more. And that's how it should be for us, guys. That's how it should be for us. Any taste of Christ should make us hunger for more. Once you have drunk of his presence, then guess what? It should make you thirst for more. So that's one of those moments as I say that now. Take a look at your life. Because your life will tell you what you're hungry for. And I'm not talking about, you know, a good burrito or anything. You know, video and the cheese is melting off of me. You're like, you know. That type of thing, because I like food too, right? And I get hungry. But that's not what I'm talking about. Look at your life. Really look at your life. It'll tell you. What are you hungering for? What, what are you hungry for? What's that drive in your life? What are you thirsty for? What are you thirsting after? There's all, there's all kinds of things that we could be. But what is it for each and every one of us? That's a question you ask yourself. And I'll tell you this quickly. You can lie to all of us. You can play games. You can do all that. But the Lord sees you. He already knows. He already knows what you're hungry for, what you're going after, what you're seeking in life. 
He knows those things already. So don't try to fool yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Be real. Be honest. Ask the Lord, Lord, reveal to me what I'm really after here. Is it you? Because if it's not, reveal that to me. I want a hunger for you. I want you to be the center of my life. Because that's what it should be, guys. That's what it should be. The number one relationship in my life that supersedes anything, even my wife, is my relationship with Jesus Christ. My family knows it. My wife knows it. My kids know it. It's my relationship with Jesus Christ. It supersedes everything. And when you've had a, an encounter with the risen Savior, you've been born again. He's transformed you. The Holy Spirit now resides in you. You've got a new nature. You're born again. I want more, not less. I want more. I'm thirsty for more. Jesus, give me more. I want to know you more. So take a look at your own walk. What are you hungering for? What are you thirsty for? What are those things in your life? Then notice he says, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And we know that he's been in prison. He's in prison while writing this. This is a prison epistle. And notice what he says and count them as rubbish. I love the King James here. If you guys have a King James, I don't know who does, but if you have one, look at that word right now. Mine in the new King James says rubbish. And the word can mean rubbish. But in the King James, it says and count them as dung. <laughs> dung. <laughs> dung, right? I counted it all as a big steaming pile of dung. If you don't know what dung is, go ahead and Google it. All right. Go ahead. But you might not, you might want to turn like images off or something because it might come up kind of crazy. But oh. <laughs> but here, here's all right here's a little thing you see it every day you see it every day but he says all that's counted as a big steaming pile of dung i want you to think about that what he's saying right there think about that because that, that paints a vivid picture in your mind like you just pictures pop in your mind and you're like oh that's what paul is saying all that is a big steaming pile of dung. Picture that steaming pile of dung. Think about that. That's what Paul is saying here. That's strong language. That's pretty strong language. That indicates to us that what? That's how bad that is to God. That all that stuff. It's like a pile of dung, a big, stinky, steaming <laughs> pile of dung. All right. It's like my son, Sam, right? He'll come into the restroom after someone and he's like, oh, it's witty, stinky. And <laughs> it smelled witty bad. Well, that's what it, it's like to God when we try to do all that stuff. And we put Christ to the side. And God's like, that smells witty bad. <laughs> it's bad. That's what Paul is saying to us. That's how bad this is. That's why we have these warnings. And he says, beware three times. Because though we are laughing and I smile and I like to crack jokes, this is serious business to God. That's why we have the three warnings. Three times he says, beware. It's like when I tell my kids, if I say it once, it's already important. If I have to say it multiple times, come on. How many times do I have to say it before you listen? And we have time, beware, beware, beware. And then we see how bad it really is. It's it's dumb to God. It stinks. It amounts to nothing. So he says, I count it as dumb that I may gain Christ. He realized 
that all of that stuff was worthless. It was useless. It was stinky. It was nasty. It was dumb. It was bad. But what matters is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And then he says, not having my own righteousness. Notice he says, my own. When we get to heaven, you're not going to get up there and you're going to say, I hope you're not going to say, God, look at what I did. I hope you don't want to get to heaven and say, God, I'll stand on my own righteousness. Because you know what? I didn't kill. I didn't cheat on my wife. I paid my taxes. The bills never get, or the utilities never got cut off. I was a good worker. Are you going to get up there and try to stand on your own good stuff? Yeah, I went to church. I sang the songs. I got, you know, over a lifetime, Lord, I got like 399 stickers, golden stars. Is that Cal for anything? Yeah, they there crying in front of God. Oh, God, that counts for something. God, they're like, no, what did you do with my son? I sent my son into the world. If you believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. Why did I do that? Because I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't want anyone to go there. So I sent him and I gave you a choice. Please, none of you trust in your own stuff. Don't trust that you go to church every Sunday. Don't trust that you grew up in a Christian home. Don't trust that your dad preaches the Bible, that he teaches. You can't ride the coattails of someone else's faith into heaven. It does not work like that. There's nothing you can do that will be good enough ever. Salvation is all of grace. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. We'll never earn it. We'll never deserve it. It's grace. You can never work your way in. You can never be good enough. If you could, Jesus Christ never had to die. If any of us could be good enough, then he didn't have to come and die and take our place. But he did. And all you have to do is put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I need you. Forgive me of all the dumb things I've ever done. That's all you got to do. And the Bible says you will, you will be saved. But it's all of him. It's all of grace. It's all of Jesus Christ. It's nothing of me. It's all of him. And Paul figured that out on the road to Damascus. And he got knocked off and he's on his back and he's, Lord, who are you? It's me, Jesus Christ, whom you've been persecuting. Isn't it hard for you to kick against the goats? And he's like, oh, man, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? It's not about our own righteousness, guys. It never was. And it's not a shock to God if you think you're so horrible. He knows you. It's why he came. Because he knows you. Because he loves you. It will never change. Those things will never change. So which righteousness do you want to have, your own or the through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith? Second Corinthians, let's wrap this up. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's not about us. It's always about him. It's not about relationship or it's not about religion. It's about relationship, a living relationship with a risen Savior. That's what this is about. 
It's not about what you can do or what you have done. It's about what he has done. And Jesus Christ himself said, it is finished. It is finished, you guys. And there's going to be people who come along and say, no, you've got to do this. And you got to do that. And how come you're not this anymore? How come you're not a Catholic? And how come you're not this? And you need to go there. And you need to go. Don't listen to all that Paul says. It's about Jesus Christ. <coughs> Repent. Repent. And you look at it, as I look at it, I'll close with this thought. And it's sad because so many people are trying to be good. Trying to be so good. And the whole point is we're not. And there's nothing that we can do about that. I can't make myself good no matter what I do. I have a sin nature, and that sin nature needs to be dealt with. That's why Jesus Christ came. I'm always so amazed that he did. Because I know who I am. I know what I've done. I know all the bad. I know it. A lot of us have a lot of stories that we could tell, but we don't. We don't. Because we don't want, frankly, we don't want people to know. We know how horrible we are. We know it. God knows it too. And his love is so great, he didn't just sit there in heaven and say, ah, I'm going to let them all perish. No. He said, I'm going to be the way. Because there is no way without me. I encourage you guys, take a look. Just take a look. Take a look. Because sometimes we start trusting in a lot of different things. And we haven't really put our trust in Jesus Christ. We're trusting in the fact that I do this. Or that I've done this. And we're not really trusting Jesus Christ. Take a look at your life. If your eyes are open and you're breathing, you still have a shot. You still have breath in your lungs. You can still cry out to the Lord. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. Jesus Christ died. He said, it is finished. Just turn to him. Turn to him. Like the, the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Don't trust in yourself, guys. Trust in him. Take a look at your life. What does it tell you? It will always reveal to you who you really are, what you're really doing, what you're really after in life. If you're honest and you look at your life, what does it show you? What does it tell you? Are you after Jesus Christ or not? I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, man, as we look at this portion of scripture, Lord, and just think about everything you've done, Lord, and as we think about our own lives, it is so awesome what you've done for us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you would impress these things upon our hearts. Help us, Father, to understand these things, to process them, and to live them out, Lord, to, to have them sink deep within us. If we're not hungering for you, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that to us that you would give us a greater hunger, a greater thirst for you, for your kingdom, for your righteousness. Lord, it starts with us, Father. If we want our loved ones to be saved, to know you, we first have to know you. 
So, Father, work in our lives like never before. Reveal those things to us. And help us, Lord. Strengthen us as we go through life. Reveal yourself to us in a greater way, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to grow. Father, we love you. We're here because we love you and we want more. Help us to grow. And Father, use us as we go about this week. Use us wherever we're at, Lord. I pray that you would use all of us. That we would make a determination to shine our light. To let it shine. To let it shine, Lord, for you. And we pray that you would be glorified. So be with us, Lord, throughout the week. Remind us of these things. And help these things to be planted within our heart so that when they grow, they bring forth much fruit. We love you, Lord. And we ask these things, believing it's according to your will. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys online. God bless you. I see some comments. Um, it's kind of blurry because I'm so young. My eyes are bad. <laughs> Um, but I love you guys. If you have any prayer requests or anything, put it on any comment section anywhere. Please put it somewhere. Someone will see it. Lift it to the throne of grace on your behalf. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. I love you guys. You too. Um, yeah, I love you guys. Prayer, put it somewhere. Um, look out for some new shorts coming out pretty soon. Yeah, it'll be good. Check out the YouTube page. I love you guys. God bless you from the bottom of my heart. I'll see you next week. Read ahead. <laughs> All right. That was my wife, YouTube. See that? God bless you guys.